Welcome to South Metro Vineyard Church online. If you're new here, check on our website. Fill out the digital connection cards so we can get to know you. There's digital stuff happening during the week for kids and grown-ups. If you like to give money for our church, you can do that on our website too. If you if you like the old fashioned way, you can mail a check. Everyone loves getting mail. If you need anything, email us. If we can pray for you, email us. That's all. I hope you're ready to connect with Jesus. Bye. Hello, South Metro Vineyard friends and family. My name is Jack, and I'm so glad that uh, you are joining us here on our online worship service. And so part of the online worship service, like a real cool little feature, is there's these live comments. Maybe you've seen them before where you can go and type out good morning and then everybody else watching gets to see that and then say good morning back to you. So if you're able, why don't you why don't you do that? Why don't you let us know where you're tuning in from or maybe who you're tuning in with and just say good morning. We love we love interacting with you guys. We love to be able to say good morning back to you to like send you guys the little heart things on the on the comments that you can do on Facebook. It's it's a joy to be able to do that, even though we are so far away from each other. Plus, we kind of get to t uh, we get to talk to each other during Greg's sermon, which is kind of funny. We couldn't really do that before unless we were whispering to each other. But I don't know. I find that funny. If you remember, uh, a couple weeks ago, we did a confession of worship together before we we started singing. And what it is, it's basically a a prayer that we get to say out loud together that helps. Um, kind of unify us as the body, but also helps us um, center our hearts and center our minds on Jesus as we enter into a space of worship. And I would love if we could try and do that again today. And so I have it right here. I will put it up on the screen. I changed one word for us to fit our context a little better, but would you say this with me? We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this space to worship God. We have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers. We are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
God, I just pray that you would help us. Help us to let go and to trust you. Lord, would you continue to form your heart, your heart in us. To 
move us to compassion and move us to mercy, to forgiveness. That you would break our hearts for what breaks yours, Lord. And you would fill us with the love to go and love others, to love our brothers and sisters. We thank you for this time spent with you this morning. We thank you for the ways that you're moving throughout our households, throughout our towns, our communities, our cities, Lord. And you just pray for more of that, more of you. As you continue to move and continue to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Well, you guys, thanks for worshiping with me. I hope you enjoy the message, and I hope you have an awesome day. Peace out, guys. Hi, South Metro Vineyard Church and everybody joining us online. We are starting a new sermon series today called The Upside Down Kingdom. Uh, it comes from one of Jesus' longest recorded sermons and most influential, known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you can find that text, Matthew chapters 5 uh, through 7, and we encourage you to read that text in light of our current realities and our struggles. And uh, what Jesus addresses in the Sermon on the Mount, why it still matters today more than ever, and if people would just obey it, the world would be oh, a better place. And so let me ask you a question. If someone responds to Jesus' invitation uh, and invites him into their life, and if someone claims to be a, a Christian, shouldn't we expect them to be different? I think the question also is, do we expect our lives to be changed? And how much really do we expect our lives to be changed as a result of becoming a follower of Jesus? Uh, shouldn't we expect followers of Jesus uh, to be more honest, to be more loving, to be kinder, to be more uh, consistent, more authentic, more transparent. Uh, shouldn't we expect uh, uh, the result of somebody coming to know Jesus, a person would be a safer person to be around, uh, someone who deeply loves and who stands for the things that Jesus does. Aren't we supposed to live better lives as followers of, of Christ? And when we look into the Gospels, uh, the New Testament accounts of Jesus' life, I think Jesus actually expected that our lives would change as a result of knowing him, following him, and obeying his teachings. Uh, it's kind of known in the, in the Western world, in American Christianity, that a lot of times we come in and out of church, uh, we learn something new, but very rarely do we put it into practice and do we obey it. So what does it look like when we actually follow through with the things that Jesus taught, that we would apply them into our lives, and that we would begin to live the lives that we were created for? Uh, right, right before Jesus is uh, calling his first disciples to, to follow him, calling them out from living ordinary lives to living extraordinary lives for the kingdom, um, it says this in Matthew 4, uh, 23 through 25. It says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all, and large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea, and from the east of the Jordan River. It goes on in chapter 5, 1 and 2. One day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and began, he began to teach them. And so one of the first things we see here is the importance of Jesus' teaching, uh, that we're meant to be uh, taught by Jesus. And one of the major ways that we can begin to see our lives uh, change is taking the, the teachings of Jesus seriously. Dallard, Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, says, if you play a game of word association today, in almost any setting, you will collect some familiar names around words such as 
smart, knowledgeable, intelligent, and so forth. Einstein, Bill Gates of Microsoft, and the obligatory uh, rocket scientists will stand out. But one person who will pretty certainly not come up in this connection is Jesus. And then he says this, and can we seriously imagine that Jesus could be Lord if he were not smart? If he were divine, would he be dumb or uninformed? Once you stop to think about it, how could he be what we take him to be in all other respects and not be the best informed and most intelligent person of all, the smartest person who ever lived? Now, have you ever thought of the scriptures and Jesus teachings and the word that we get, do we, do we, have you ever thought of him as being the smartest person who ever lived? Do we treat Jesus teachings as the best teachings that we have available to us as we look into the scriptures? Uh, because I think one of the reasons that we don't live the life that we were created for is simply because Jesus is not our teacher, or if he is, we don't take them at the value that they're worth and put them into practice. Because Quite frankly, I truly believe that his words should be the rule of our lives and anything that contradicts them should be thrown away. Um, even, even in this text over time, uh, the, the church devised different ways uh, to uh, not apply this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount uh, to their lives. They would say things like the Sermon on the Mount is only for the future or the Sermon on the Mount is only for extraordinary times, like the end times. The Sermon on the Mount is only for special people, like monks or pastors. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount only applies to your interior life and not the real world. But the interesting thing about the Sermon on the Mount is that the first three centuries of the church, no other biblical passage was taught on or referred to more than Matthew 5, through seven. The Christian church in the, in the first centuries believed that this message was meant to be deliberately obeyed and seriously applied to the life of every single follower of Christ without exception. And so we should too. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is, is very carefully structured. It has the nine Beatitudes uh, and salt and light metaphors from the sermon's introduction and in Matthew 5 it provides the thesis statement of the greater righteousness required by Jesus' disciples. Uh, on in Matthew 5, 21 through 48, uh, contrast Jesus' teaching with the law. Um, in Matthew 6, there's contrast the true and the hypocritical piety uh, by means of three examples. Uh, Matthew 6, 19 through 34 turns to social issues with various commands regarding money and, and true issues. Matthew 7, 1 through 12 gives uh, three further commands on how to treat others. Uh, Matthew 7, 13 through 27 concludes with a sermon with three illustrations of only two possible responses to Jesus' message. Um, and we can, this teaching is so rich. I mean, we can just take one thing out of it and apply it to our lives and it could change us and it could change the world around us. When, when the Sermon on the Mount has been taken seriously, it has brought renewal to congregations and revival to societies. And we need that right now more than ever. We need to see a move of God. I don't know about you, but you know these past few weeks have been incredibly heavy. I mean, things are already heavy with COVID-19, uh, but with the social, um, racial uh, un unrest that's that's going on, uh, injustice that's going on ar around uh, our country. It's just been uh, very heavy, and we need for God's kingdom to come, for his will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, what is God doing? And what is the role that he's calling the church to play in the midst of all of this because we do know no matter what that god is at work we might not know where he's at working but we know that he is at work and that he is redeeming that he is continuing with his missio day his mission in the world of drawing all men to himself now matthew's account of the life of jesus is organized around five different main teachings of jesus in fact matthew presents Jesus to the Jewish people as the new Moses, 
Moses gave the Israelites what we call the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, or what the Jews call the Torah. And the book of Matthew is organized around five central teachings of what Jesus brought to us from the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7, Jesus' Sermon on Missions in chapter 10, the Sermon of, of the Mystery of the Kingdom in chapter 13, the Sermon on Management in chapter 18, and the second Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon of the Mount of Olives in chapters 25, 24 through 25. And each of these f different teachings end with a statement like this. Matthew 7, 28 through 29, it says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teachings, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Uh, and Jesus was not uh, offering just hard sayings or high ideals. He was giving his followers concrete ways to put into practice the will of God in our lives in, in this world and to be delivered uh, from the bondage of sin in our lives in this world, to be free and to live differently. And if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, a Jesus follower, uh, then at the core it means that you take his teachings seriously enough to obey them. Um, so, you know, who are you uh, learning how to live from uh, is a question I have for you. Um, are you taking this seriously? Are you applying it to your life? Uh, is, it, is it the Bible? Do you see Jesus as one of the smartest people who ever lived? Um, where do you get your information from? Uh, is it social media? Uh, sometimes I see people posting all kinds of things on social media with no sources. And with, with most worlds of thinking, uh, you'd always have at least two sources before you would repost something or say anything. You fact check, you want to have good information. Um, and uh, we want to make sure we're following the Bible. We're going to, to be studying through these teachings for the next few months. Um, and I invite you to take what Jesus is teaching to us very seriously. He created life. He knows how it's supposed to work. And, and we should apply this to our lives. We're, we should not only listen to Jesus' teachings, we're meant to be impacted by the kingdom of God. Before we just go out uh, to live Jesus' teaching, to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, to remove all lust or anger from our lives, uh, it's important that we understand the context of his teachings. Jesus is showing us what life looks like that has been impacted by the kingdom of God. Um, it says, again, in uh, 23 and 24, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. Not only was he announcing, he was demonstrating. It says he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. And so we see the structure of Jesus' ministry of salvation, healing, and deliverance. Uh, that when we saw the kingdom come through Jesus' life and ministry, those are the same things that we're, we saw. And so uh, he, he's proclamating, he's demonstrating uh, uh, the, the good news. Um, uh, and he, he would go around preaching and demonstrating. And here's what we read in Mark 1. It says, later on, uh, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. He was announcing and demonstrating a great fact that had happened. He's telling the people that history has reached a fulfillment point, a turning point. Uh, a new covenant, this, this kingdom of God, the people were looking forward to a future reality towards which uh, they were on their way. The kingdom of God has permeated and invaded their earthly existence. And Jesus is telling people uh, that a whole new uh, world order is breaking in upon them, that things are changing. Uh, another kingdom is invading their world. And how, again, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
And so if we, if we look at, if we step back and, and, and uh, get a big view of God's story of redemption in the world, we see, you know, God created the universe and it was very, very good. But humanity rebelled, turned away from God, pushed God to the margins of life, refused to take God seriously. And we all live in the pain and brokenness as a result of that. God could have abandoned us, but he did not. In the Old Testament, he made a way for his people to come to him. He God chooses one person, Abraham, and, and through him he creates a nation to point people back to God. And then God sent prophets who could see down the timeline of history to the future where God would intervene in chasm, uh, chasm, uh, uh, cataclysmic ways, the day of the Lord. On that day, God would defeat the enemies of his people and would judge the world. The kingdom of God is what the Jewish people longed for, a time when all that is wrong would be made right, sins forgiven, healing of our bodies, and now pouring of the Holy Spirit. The future breaks into the world in the person of Jesus. In Jesus, we see that his righteousness, peace, healing, forgiveness, was not just for some distant future, but it is the right now beginning to permeate in the world in the reality of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But also, it says that not everyone can enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone, in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. We live in an upside down world. There's no doubt about it. But when the kingdom of God breaks into an individual's life through faith and repentance, we start to live right side up. And you see the qualities Jesus is, is listing. are They're not natural qualities. You and I can't just go out and, and begin to live this, be poor in spirit to mourning, to being meek, to hungering and thirsting for righteousness, to being merciful, of being pure in heart, being a peacemaker. These are all character qualities that are produced in anyone's life that has surrendered to God's kingdom. Before the kingdom breaks into your life, if you read something like the Sermon on the Mount, it just seems uh, impossible, uh, completely unrealistic, and totally out of reach. Eternal life is an entirely new life that God intends us to live. And the only way you can put the Sermon on the Mount into practice is if the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel as the kingdom, has gotten in to you, has gotten a hold of you. And so the question I have for you as we move into this series is, has the gospel of the kingdom invaded your life so much so that it is above anything and everything else, that your main allegiance lies with Jesus and his kingdom. Do you live under the authority of King Jesus? Have you experienced what Jesus has called being born again? And have you experienced this new life breaking in on you, God's love and his mercy and his grace that he extends to all people, uh, that one day every tongue, tribe, and nation will come in together and worship all of humanity in one and worship at his feet. For those of you who maybe uh, the kingdom of God has invaded your life, you, you've responded to Jesus at some point, but sometimes we kind of veer off track and we need, uh, as Rich Nathan said this last week in a message, we need a renewed radical commitment to the kingdom of God. We need a renewed radical commitment to the kingdom of God. God. Rich said that in a um, sermon um, named How the Evangelicals, Evangelicals Should Respond to the Death of George Floyd. And he, he said at one point, he said, we uh, as evangelicals uh, should start moving away from uh, putting all of our hope and faith and, and trust into uh, one political party or, or one politician but that we need this renewed commitment to King Jesus and the kingdom of God first. And to that I say, amen. Um, what does the Bible say, you know? And we're meant to be active participants 
in the kingdom of God. We're to be taught by Jesus. We're uh, to uh, be impacted by the kingdom of God. And then we're to become active participants of the kingdom of God. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it uh, is wise, like a person who builds his house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. This life of the kingdom is not automatic. Rather, God invites us to actively participate in the gospel of the kingdom where he is in the lead. We, you and I have been invited uh, to put the words of Jesus into practice today and be changed by them to be called in to the kingdom and become a kingdom person because the kingdom of God has invaded your life and has powerfully impacted you because the spirit of God lives in you, because you have been grabbed hold of by the gospel, because God is at work in you. And it is because of the grace of God that you and I can participate with God's intention for our lives by actively putting into practice the words of the Sermon on the Mount. And submission to these words, obedience, follow through, will enable us to live a life that you and I were created for. And again, we must make every effort uh, to be a part of the kingdom, to speak up and to speak out for the things that are important uh, to Jesus and to live this message out. His words should be the rule of our lives and anything that contradicts them should be thrown away. And my hope is that in the days to come that we will take next steps to become more like Jesus and begin living the life we were created for. But the first step uh, is that Jesus is inviting uh, you into a relationship, into the kingdom where he is king um, and where his words rule your life. Uh, so have you come to the realization your, your desperate need for God and your spiritual poverty before God? Have, has your heart been broken for the things that break the heart of God? And if not, ask yourself why. What's going on? What's going on uh, with you whenever you look out into the world uh, and you see injustice, uh, but you don't speak up or say anything about it? What's going on in your heart? Um, how, how have... Have we sinned against God in others? Uh, how do we need to be repentant uh, in the condition that the world's in? Uh, how, how do we need to respond and, and what's our uh, responsibility? What have we been complicit in? And do you really trust God in all of your life that he will meet all of your needs, that he's at work, that he's doing something? Because I believe he is. And I believe that you and I get the opportunity uh, to follow where he's leading. And I think on the other side of all of this, we're going to see some amazing things. Um, that's what I pray, and that's what I, I hope. And I hope that you hope that too. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, uh, we just thank you for your words. Uh, we just thank you for how you've been present over these last few months, uh, even though we're not sure as we cry out. Uh, we're not sure at times where you work, but we can always trust that you are at work. Uh, we put our faith and trust in, in that, and I just pray that as we listen uh, to your words over these next few weeks uh, uh, in, in this sermon uh, that you gave, uh, that we would not only hear it, but we would apply it, that it would change our lives and it would change the world, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And we just pray that in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.